This is June 13th, 1985. This is Joe Todd and Bernice Jackson, an interview with Mr. Vernon L. Williams in Woodward, Oklahoma. Sir, where were you born? Piedmont, Oklahoma. And when's your birthday? November 19. What year? 21. 1921. Who is your father? Fred Williams. And your mother? Jane Williams. Jane Kennedy Williams. Kennedy. Where were your parents from? Actually, my father was from Virginia, Marion, Virginia. My mother came, uh, actually she was born here, but she was, uh, her people came from uh, Missouri mm -hmm. and uh, Kentucky, Illinois, that area. Why did your folks come to Oklahoma? Well, my father came in a covered wagon to Oklahoma as a baby, and his father homesteaded here. Where was his homestead? Uh, out uh, in the eastern edge of Canadian County back uh, east of Piedmont, Oklahoma. Did he come in for the run? No. Is that the run then? Yes. Okay. Did your father tell any stories about the wagon trip to Oklahoma? Well, he was too young to know anything about it. Mm -hmm. He was only three years old. Okay. What about your mother's family? Well, actually, they actually don't talk much about uh, Never did talk a great deal about it. I have some pictures of some of the family, you know, taken back in 1896. Mm -hmm. And where did your mother's family sit? Well, actually, uh, close to Oklahoma City, down around Jones, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. They homestead there? Uh, I don't know whether they homesteaded or not. I know that many of them own land across there, mm -hmm. so that's the best I can say. And what kind of work did your father do? He was a farmer. Farmer. My mother taught school, and she grew up and uh, married my father, of course. Mm -hmm. How big was the farm you grew up on? How big was the farm? Yes, sir. That they grew up, or I? That you grew up on. Uh, actually, we farmed about, uh, we had about three quarters of a section. Mm -hmm. What was your main crop? Wheat. Wheat. As a small boy, what chores do you do around the farm? Well, actually, we milked uh, a lot of cattle, cows, and sold uh, cream, and of course we raised chickens. We always had to have chickens, you know, and, and cattle and pigs because uh, that was the meat that you ate. And, uh, uh, we raised uh, wheat, sometimes even took the wheat in and traded it out for flour. You know. I grew up corn the same way for corn meal. Did you do your own butchering? Yes. Farm? Yes. What time of year would you butcher? In the fall. Fall. And how many hogs did you butcher at one time? Usually just one, but sometimes two. Right. Now, was this a cooperative effort? Did all the neighbors get together at butchering time, or? Usually, uh, two or three neighbors, in, in our case, would get together. Butchering. And how much lard could you render out of a good-sized hog? <laughs> you know, no, I really don't. I don't remember. I, I helped do that, but I don't recall what it uh, produced. When you were a small boy in the farm, did you still have the uh, the header, the header barge? Actually, we had uh, a binder. We bound grain with the binder when I grew up. Okay, tell me about wheat harvest. Well, actually, we bound it and shocked it in the fields, you know, and then, uh, thrashed it with a thrashing machine. Now, what is the difference between binding wheat and then using the header and header barge? What's the difference? Well, maybe that's what you're talking about. Uh, a binder, do you know what a binder is? Not really. Well, actually, a binder just uh, had about a, oh, a six, seven foot swath, you know, run it up and put it into bundles, tied it in with a bun into a bundle and dropped it out in a row and then just shocked it up, you know, until time to thrash so it could dry out. Is that the same thing or is that different? No, that's different. It is. I didn't think a header was yeah. a binder. That, the header was before the binder, I believe. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Well, 
Well, I grew up when we used binders and we used them all over. And that still had headers? And uh, oh. it just bound the grain, you know, and then we shocked it up. And then you hauled it to the thrashing machine? Hauled it to the thrashing machine. But the header is different than that. But I believe the header's older than the binder. You think so? I think so. Well, I've heard my husband talk in Illinois, they bound. Yeah. Because he would, uh, he was hired to haul it in mm -hmm. and to shop. You know, years ago when there weren't many thrashing machines, they'd actually haul the bundles in and uh, set them up, you know, in a pile. Mm -hmm. And then pull the machine in between them, you know, and just pitch right off of these huge piles of bundles. Well, that was so much more work than using the header and the barges. I, I, I believe the header and barges came after the binding. Now, are you talking about a combine? No. The header and the Combines came in in the country I was raised in, you know, at the latter part. At first, they, they were uh, self-powered, but they would pull with a tractor, you know. And, uh, yeah, the, uh, the header was in. pulled by, what, six horses? <coughs> yes. And then it elevated the wheat up into the header barge. Yes. And then it's hauled off. Well, it's then you're talking about a horse-drawn combine. Yeah. No horse-drawn header. That's what it's called, a header, but it actually was a combine. It was thrashing it at the time? No. No, no. It just cut it, and then the whole, the, the wheat stalk, everything in the head went up in this header barge. Stacked in the barge, mm -hmm. and that was pulled off and stacked up. I've never seen one in operation in my life. Well, I've got some pictures of them. I'll have to show you. I think it's different parts of the country yeah. we're probably talking yeah. about that this happened. Did you use these in the panhandle? Yes, we used the header. We never did use the binder in the panhandle. Mm -hmm. Why did they not use the binder? You know? So much work. So much work. Oh, we had more wheat out there, more land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, the quality of wheat they raised out in those days wasn't very much. Uh, it's a general rule. They'd have good crops, you know. Well, using the header, they could go in and, and cut the wheat while they were still just a little green. Well, we always cut it green, you know, to shop. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when they put it in these stacks, and I've seen in my father's field five or six uh, stacks. I can see now what you're talking about while you're saying it's less work. Because you could probably just set that down when you hold it in, can you? You haul that in off of the field when you... And the header, but no, it had to be pitched onto the stack. And that wheat that was a little bit green was would be a little heavy. And that's where the work started. And then when they would empty this barge, there would be another barge probably filled and ready to pull in, and they'd pull out and go to the header. And uh, when this uh, uh, grain would be augured up into the header, well, it, it took two men in each barge, one to drive the team, and and then they would have to move this back into the corners to make room, you know, and, and sort of trap it down so they could get as much. It was a lot of work. I don't care which way they went. <laughs> <laughs> but there would be more footwork in yes. binding it, wouldn't it? Yes, probably. When you say you shock the wheat, yes. What do you do? Actually, you take the bundles that were bound, you know, and set them up with the heads up to keep the heads out of the dirt. And so they would dry out. And you just put two bundles together, set them, make, start a shock, and put the rest of them around. How big are the bundles? All the bundles were usually about, uh, oh, we'd say anywhere from a foot to 14, 15 inches, you know, across. How long did we have to drive before it's fresh? Uh, actually, not a great deal of time, but uh, of course that was to preserve that wheat, you know. You didn't want it laying down there and sprouting in the ground. And uh, of course, you, it dried out so well, you, you're bound to lose some of that then when you're hauling it in because you'd shatter the grain out when you haul it in. Um, what time period are we talking about? Wheat harvest. Wheat harvest? Well, actually, you started uh, in June, and usually you were finishing thrashing uh, 
along the fourth from fourth of July to the middle of July okay. when I was growing up. Yeah. And what years? What years did yeah. I work in? Well, let's see. 31. 31. I started about 1934. 34. And worked up to uh, 39. Is this around Piedmont? Actually, uh, in the Deer Creek area of Edmond, where I actually did my work. And where was the grain elevator? In Edmond. Edmond. Remember who owned that? Rodkeys. 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 Mm -hmm. What was the price of wheat at that time? Oh, it ranged uh, anywhere from a uh, dollar and a half, two dollars up to three. So. Now that's kind of an estimate on my part, but that sounds about right. You know, wheat got you get to talking about the prices of wheat, I, I'm listening now because I'm listening to people talk, you know, uh, who are selling wheat today. And uh, back 20 years ago, 30 years ago, wheat, even 40 to 50 years ago, you know, wheat sometimes were as high as it is now. That's right. Certainly true. Mm -hmm. Hey, where'd you start the school? Piedmont, Oklahoma. Piedmont, Oklahoma. How large is the school? Oh, it had uh, all the grades, and it's a consolidated school. It had all the grades up through high school. How many students were there? Oh, I'd say probably, when I went there, 150, 200. And what year did you graduate from high school? 1939. 1939. What did you do after graduation? Well, I started the college that fall at uh, Central State, didn't I? I didn't stay, I might have. <laughs> I started. What were you, you going to study in college? Electrical engineering when I first went into it. Why did you go to Central State? Close. How large was it? How many students in Central State? Oh, at uh, that particular time, I'd say, uh, well, 3,000, 4,000. And how long did you go to school there? I actually went there about eight weeks, and, uh, then quit. Mm -hmm. I was working and going to school, and I could never get the schedule fit. <laughs> and it's kind of, you know, embarrassing to sleep through the classes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because I worked every night, seven nights a week. What were you working? I was working in a bowling alley, setting pins and doing anything else there was. Yeah, did Did you set the pins by hand? We did at that time. How do you do that? Just pick them up and set them on the spot. You didn't have the little fancy machines or anything to do. You just not 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 there. Not there. These were ten pins they called them at the time, and that's a little smaller, I think, than the regular bowling pins today. Uh, nonetheless, that was a job, and uh, it made me a living, you know. For life. What salary were you making at that time? Oh, gracious, it didn't amount to very much. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Did the Depression affect you and your family in the 30s? Very definitely. How? Well, uh, there just wasn't anything. Uh, of course, living on the farm, I thought, was a very fortunate thing, because we had our own meat, eggs, chickens, and we raised uh, all kinds of animals, you know, for food, and we had our own wheat, grain, and so forth, and we worked horses primarily, and we raised feed for them. So I thought being on the farm at that particular time was the best place to be in the world. Because what people, breed of horses did you have? Pardon me? What breed of horses did you have? What breed? <laughs> I'd call them mixed. <laughs> Yeah, the people I've talked to said the farmers weren't hurt as bad as the rest of the country in that depression. Oh, I think that'd be right from what I observed because we had relatives in Oklahoma City living in cardboard shacks. They had to do well to have a cardboard shack and we haul food to them. Yeah. Because some of these old farmers said, well, we had no money. Yes. So we didn't lose any money in the bank failure. That's right. You didn't have any money. You. You took your uh, cream in and sold the cream and got cash and bought the other goods that you needed to go with what you had, you know. And the eggs, sold cream and eggs. And uh, 
course, we raised everything, turkeys, ducks, guineas, and uh, you name it, you know. And guineas, you know, were real good eating. I don't know if you ever ate any of them. They're dark meat, but very good. We raised young guineas. And they eat watchdogs, too. You, you're not kidding about that. They'll let you know when anybody comes around the country within the area. <laughs> but they were very good eating, and uh, my mother hatched them herself, you know, with incubator. December 7th, 1941. Yes. What were you doing? I was working on uh, aircraft at uh, Wally Post Airport, old Wally Post Airport. That, uh, so that's on May Avenue. It's now a shopping center. So you were an aircraft mechanic then? That I was a apprentice mechanic. Aircraft. What made you go into aircraft uh, mechanics? Well, first I was very interested in aviation as a child growing up. I was interested in airplanes. I was interested in flying. And I went to work uh, for just a short time in a filling station right near that airport. Got acquainted with uh, one of the guys that owned that son or brother. And he said, why don't you come up and help us? Well, that was an open door. <laughs> and I went. <laughs> and I worked there and, uh, until I went into the service. In fact, I left there and went into the service. When did you see your first airplane? When did I see my first one? My, as a small child, I saw one fly over, you know. Is that what started the interest? Well, that helped generate it, yes. Mm -hmm. And what was your first reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Well, I was shocked, and I admittedly, I didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was. <laughs> Frankly, I did not. And I was working on the ramp. In fact, as I was changing the oil on a uh, Waco UPF-7 on the ramp of that uh, hangar when I heard that uh, the Japanese had hit Pearl Harbor. And uh, just momentarily, I had no idea where Hawaii was <laughs> in my mind. And then did you enlist when you drafted? Actually, I enlisted. But uh, I was uh, had already been classified as 1A. The boss was trying to get me out of it so that I could stay. They needed help, and uh, I was uh, I had uh, without any uh, formal training had uh, studied and taken the tests, and I'd passed out of th uh, three out of five sections of the uh, aircraft and engine exam. And uh, as I look back at it, that was not too bad. <laughs> because you needed a lot of formal training, a lot more, you know. And I'd just study books that they'd give me, you know. And, and uh, they'd always get me on technical things. <laughs> That's where they'd swallow me, you know. But uh, I enjoyed the work very much. And you enlisted on what day? Oh, I went in in uh, August of 1942, I believe. 41 or 2. When Pearl Harbor fell in 40? At December 41. So it'd be in 42 that I went in, yes. And did you enlist in the Army Air Corps? Yes. And where'd you take your basic training? Actually, uh, when I enlisted, they sent me to uh, Fort Sill and then uh, on up to Enid. And I really took my basic uh, primarily in Enid. It wasn't a, very much of a basic. Tell me about, about basic in Enid. Well, all I did was just the thing of marching, teaching you to march, and uh, how to take orders, and uh, that sort of thing. And of course, we got a little of that at Fort Sill while we were there for a couple of weeks. You know, they started teaching. You know, immediately you've got to you got the people there, and saw a lot of films. And, uh, put you on KP and let you know what that was all about. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the commander of the base in Eden at that time? I have no idea. Not even a dream as I think about it. Who he was. When you left basic, where'd you go? Actually, uh, we shipped. I had an opportunity to go into an overseas unit. And so we shipped to, uh, uh, let's see, it wound up at Pendleton Field, Oregon. And it was in that transaction they lost my records going from Enid to Pendleton Field. What do you do when they lose your records? KP and guard. That's right. Doing KP and guard. 
How long did that last? Well, it lasted for two or three months, off and on, you know. And uh, I got acquainted with a man in the barracks who was in uh, photography. And uh, he was an older man, what I considered older at the time, you know. He was probably oh, 32, 35 years old. And he invited me to come and work with them in the photographic section. But at the same time this was going on, I'd made application for aviation cadets. You know, I was interested in that, and uh, so I had made application. And uh, so it all kind of came to a climax at one time. They wanted me to go to Lowry Field in Denver and study photography. And uh, I also was accepted into aviation cadets. So I shipped back out to the Pendleton Field. Uh, and went to California via Salt Lake City. You know, they didn't send very many trains down the coast at that time. So we went back to uh, Salt Lake City and uh, through Nevada and around uh, uh, to California. <coughs> I took my primary training there. You're looking at Rankin Academy, Tulare, California. What year was that? Uh, the No, I think you. the graduation was 44. Uh, yeah, that's right. So it be, uh, but that first top book there would probably have a date in it, Rankin Academy. I was in 44F. Yeah, right here. Of course, those were set up. Uh, let's see if this has a date on it. No, that's. And tell us that why mentioned? they weren't shipping uh, any boys down the coast. Well, they'd already had a few problems, you know, with the possibility of lobbing shells in the coast. And the Japanese, you know, were floating these balloon uh, bombs over. Some of them were uh, winding up in the uh, forests, in the, uh, the mountains over there. And so they kept us pretty well. They run troop trains away from the coast for that reason. The reason I wanted you to explain that because later people listening to this tape they'll wonder, well, why? So yeah, why? now, you bet. now we have it. Well, it, it, uh, when you look at it, you can see that the very, a very good reason not to do that yes. because there's no use to risk any more lives than you have to. Okay. Anything happened then? Aviation cadet school. Well, yes, they they really kept you humping. I'll tell you for sure. I what you do? I went to pre-flight in Santa Ana, California, and it was interesting to me that uh, they gave you real rigid uh, physical training and uh, disciplinary uh, training. You know, for discipline, uh, they'd pop into barracks. You know, at uh, nine o'clock at night and have a GI party scrub all the floors mm -hmm. and uh, with the GI brushes and GI soap and the thing was spotless when they came in. <laughs> you know, and you wondered if you had a, a, a feeling that you were being persecuted but you're in bad shape because <laughs> that was part of the training which I thought was very good frankly because I was born and raised on a farm where it was uh, uh, from Kent to Kent, you know. you. You started when you could work, and then when you completely unwound and didn't have enough strength to go any farther, you were through. Well, a lot of the people that I was working with had never known a lot of that, and they didn't understand it, but it wasn't any problem with me, because <laughs> I knew where we were going. Of course, as you know, the uh, uniforms, everything had to be hung on the hangers in a particular way, headed a particular direction with buttons uh, buttoned on the uh, uh, everything uh, according to regulation. The socks had to be rolled, all the clothes had to be folded in a particular way in the footlocker, and uh, it had all to be, it had to be dressed. Was that a uh, way, all so you could get into them easily if you had? Well, actually, I'd say hurt. that was uh, part of it, but that was also uh, training for the individual for his. Uh, well, I meant, and later when you'd be out on the field or something, if your clothes was just so-so, you could get in quicker. 
Well, we really didn't have any problem there. It was discipline training, and uh, they wanted you to learn to take care of things. It's like uh, going into the bathroom. You were on uh, duties all the time of sweeping and cleaning and taking care of the bathroom. And uh, I've gone, <laughs> I've gone in there, the bathroom with the officers. You know, when I was in charge, and uh, if they found one hair on the sink, you were gigged. You were given demerits. And if I was in charge of that, that was my demerit. And when I got about nine of those, ever one over nine, in one week I was out walking a tour of duty with white gloves and a rifle at 120 cadence, stepping back and forth and doing a about military about face at both ends for one hour for each demerit over nine that you got. That's where you were while everybody else, if anybody, was on leave. Weekend pass. You were out walking there. And you were inspected while you were walking out there, too. They came out to see if your white gloves were dirty. But that was uh, training uh, to see if you could take it. How they, many demerits did you have? I don't believe I ever got over three demerits in a line. I never walked it. I never walked a, an hour for any demerit. I saw to it that I didn't have those. Yes. That was the reason for it. That was the purpose. <laughs> and you learned how to take care of your clothes and take care of your being, your personal being. And when they stopped you, we had brass buckles. And those bus buckles had better not have a fingerprint on them, you know. And uh, that. That's very good training. People say that's bad. Personally, to me, it was one of the best things I ever saw done. Too bad we can't run all of our young men through it today. <laughs> In cadet school, what airplanes did you train on? Uh, this old uh, steerman here. I flew in primary training, open cockpit. I flew BT-13s and 15s, weighs about 60. 800 pounds, something like that. I had a 450 Pratt and Whitney or uh, I think the uh, Wright Cyclones were rated at about 420 horsepower in uh, basic training. And then uh, in advance, I flew uh, AT-9s. That was a Curtis type uh, airplane. And uh, it had uh, two Lycoming engines on it. It was an all metal low wing. And uh, I think you looked at that deal there, and it had the old uh, AT-17, that what they call a bamboo bomber. Well, I flew the bamboo bomber in instructor school at a later time. But I flew AT-9s, and AT-9s, uh, they used them for checking out uh, P-38 pilots early in their day. They were a very uh, unstable aircraft. Back up. Uh, they would aileron stall. You came in in a crosswind and you drop a wing down to, when you drop that wing down, well this aileron over here was down and this one was up. This wing had stalled out that was down because you had uh, disrupted the too much of the airfoil and when it had stalled out, well it would be under you. And so uh, also if you gave them full flaps and cut the power, your angle of glide was about, oh I'd say 70 degrees. so they were restricted. You didn't bring them in with full flaps. And you didn't hardly bring them in with any flaps at all. You'd bring them in at 120 miles an hour. The flaps had. You'd take them off and climb at 110. And if you lost one engine on them, you better find a place because you were on the ground pretty quick. It wouldn't fly on one engine. And that's what you flew? In advanced, training. in advanced training. Do you approve of that kind of training? Why, sure. Uh, because those thing things of it is, happen. Well, sure, and those things, uh, what uh, you would do with them, and, uh, is you would take them, because you knew, you found out real quick what they would do. Yeah. They were recommended with no flaps to bring the 189 in at 115 to 120 miles an hour. They wouldn't even check an advanced 
cadet out until he had uh, six to eight hours on him. They wouldn't let him fly. You know, solo, just as a cadet. Because they were treacherous. And the thing that happened to me on my checkout ride, uh, I always said, well, I guess that should have happened, you know, because then I really had a respect for them. But I brought them in at 120 mile an hour, and my instructor says to me, okay, you're doing a fine job. Now, he said, I want you to do one other thing. He said, you know the recommendation on this aircraft. What's the recommendation on speed? I said, 150 and 120 for approach. He said, all right, bring it in at 115 mile an hour. And I'd been bringing it in 120. And so I set it up on the approach at 115 mile an hour. Would you believe it stalled out? What do you mean by that? I, I mean it stalled. It quit just, flying. It just sat there in the air? It, well, no. It immediately it started down. into the ground. <laughs> and uh, when I felt it stalling, the I already had the throttles all the way to the hilt, and the instructor almost broke my hand when he hit the back of it, you know. <laughs> and we recovered from it and made a landing, and he grounded the aircraft. That particular aircraft. They had to take it back. And, do some work with it. Did you pass your? Oh yeah, he went ahead and we got another aircraft. We were on an auxiliary at the time. And we made a couple runs at the field and he checked me out. Because I had uh, recovered from the stall before he got to it. <laughs> you know, and uh, he didn't think it would stall. And when it stalled, he was furious. Because it was on 115 miles an hour, you know, coming in beautifully until it quit flying. How long were you into that school? Into that school? Actually, those phases, pre-flight and the flight uh, things run, I'd say, uh, they run about two to three months per section. It seems to me that uh, I went to primary training along about uh, November or December, I, had, I never even thought about that. And uh, I graduated in June the following year of advanced training. That'd be 44? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, were you, were you trained to be a pilot? That's right. From cadet school, where did you go? Uh, actually, I, cadet school, I went back to the base at Douglas, Arizona, and uh, went into instructor school. And that was not my choice. This was, uh, they wanted me as an instructor probably for some reason about my abilities or whatever. You must be pretty good then. And uh, but in those days you had what you called a standardization board and everything was done according to the standards, you know. But if you trained as an instructor on a base, you weren't a bona fide Air Force instructor. You were for that base. You had to go through another school to become a bona fide instructor. And when they uh, decided that they weren't going to uh, any longer use that base for advanced training, I was uh, transferred then into four engine. I had a choice, a four engine or uh, pulling gliders with DC-3s, that's what I called it. <laughs> it might have been, uh, I might have been flying four engine, you know, on troops. Now you, you say four inches? Yes. What do you mean four inches? Uh, troop carrier through four engine and uh, I, I don't even remember the designation because I never flew any of them, you know, but uh, carrying troops and uh, troop carrier command, whatever they, they flew at that time. I think it was a Douglas, it was a DC five, six or something. So what, what did you go into? I went into four engine four bombers, B-17s, and went to uh, Roswell, New Mexico. I took my four engine training. How long were you there? Uh, I would say about uh, two and a half, three months. Now what does four engine training consist of? Well actually they just, the uh, interesting thing about four engine in the day that I went to four engine school, uh, the difficulty with large aircraft is you can't even tell when your wings are level, you know, if you just look out at them. Small, flying smaller aircraft, it's rather simple, but 
wings get out of ways, it's, it's a little more difficult. So you had to always be sure with your artificial horizon, you know. But uh, one requirement they had before they let you loose with a four-engine bomber was you had to pass your instrument check. So you had to be able to fly instruments before you were ever turned loose with an aircraft. And uh, <clears throat> they did have a checkout system. And I didn't even know it was happening, you know, and I was commissioned at the time. But I had an instructor that had been a combat bat veteran in uh, Europe in B-17s. And uh, we landed one day, and we always flew with uh, two students, you know, for four engine. And then we had an instructor. And we had a swing seat between the two, the pilot and the co-pilot on B-17. And the instructor usually sat in the swing seat in between the seats. And uh, we landed one day, and we'd shot a couple landings. And uh, he said, uh, by the way, see that Jeep over there? And at the end of that runway, I said, yeah. And he said, well, that's uh, a major. So he's waiting on you guys to check you out. He said, Williams, I want you to fly first. And he said, by the way, this man's name is Major Butts. And said, they say he pretty well fits his name. And uh, I thought, well, I, said, <laughs> I said something to this instructor, you know, laughing about that. But uh, they had picked a man that was, I'd say he was fearless to do this job. And he knew how to do it. He risked his own life every time he put two students in. Because he did things with them that shouldn't have been done. But he wanted to know if you could fly that airplane and if you could control it. And I would say the most dangerous thing that he did was uh, he kept telling you as you came around on your base leg getting ready to turn in on the, starting your turn in on the runway. He would say, rack it up, rack it up. And finally at 200 feet, he reached down and cut the two bottom engines. The engine on the low side, which gave it the immediately wanted to roll on his back. Now when you say rack it up. Yeah, rack it up, steepen up your turn, steep it up. In time you got it vertical. Well then he cut the two bottom engines at 200 feet with the bottom. Wasn't that dangerous? Very dangerous. And he had no control of the aircraft. He was in the swing seat. But he depended on you to pull it out. He wanted to see if you could fly the airplane. That's why I say he risked his own life to see if you could fly the airplane. So what do you do when he cut the two engines? I cut the other two and, and hit the rudder with all I had to straighten it up and fed the other two back in. I left the two off. He'd cut off originally. Finished my turn, made my approach. Because he'd taken two engines from me. Says you, he said you lost one and two. I cut the other two to get control of the airplane because there was no servo on a B-17. No servos. It's manual control. Straight. And you, when you kicked a rudder, I mean you kicked it with all the force that you had. 22, 23 years old. All the force you had in your leg. You just got it out of that tendency to roll on its back, you know. Fed the other two back in and went ahead and made your approach. Two inches. And landed. Of course, another one of his tricks, as soon as you hit the ground, each green wheels up, right in your ear. What do you do then? You didn't touch it. He just wanted to see if you were listening and if you were doing what you were supposed to do and you, you weren't panicked by what he was saying. He instructed you to start with. I'll tell you to do things you're not supposed to do. Don't you do it. And he'd, you hit the ground and he'd give you two engines and say, go around. You know, take off again. And you'd say, no. He'd give you one more and you'd take off with three engines. That's pretty hard to hold. Uh, one engine on one side and two on the other. So usually if you took off this time, time you got off the ground, you were going off over this way somewhere. 
in spite of the fact, you know, that you were trying to hold it. But as soon as you could get it up off the ground, get the wheels out from under it, you could drop a wing down and you could straighten it out. And all the time, when you lost that engine, you went through the feathering procedure immediately while you were doing all the other fighting. I'd say I lost three to four pounds checking out a four-engine bottle. Perspiration. Imagine. I can imagine that was strenuous test. Mm -hmm. But that man knew you could fly the airplane. Did you pass okay? Yes. Yes, when we finished. And then when I got through, my, my friend, whose name was Wilson, alphabetized, you know, he took over and flew, and I flew co-pilot for him. But uh, I always appreciated that guy. We got, we got in, the instructor was waiting on us after we were finished, and he said, well, what do you think? I looked at him and I said, you were right about that instructor. <laughs> That's all I said to him. <laughs> but I always marveled at that, you know, that uh, the Air Force had people like that because most people could fly that airplane if they knew what they were doing because it wasn't a difficult airplane to fly. It was a very stable aircraft, the old B-17, just like the old B-24. I, or not the 24, the 25, the twin engine, the Billy Mitchell. I flew it about two, two and a half, little over two and a half hours. And it was a sweet airplane. They, that's the one they flew off the carriers, you know, to hit uh, Tokyo. Yeah, Jimmy Doolittle. Yeah, Jimmy Doolittle. Of course, Jimmy Doolittle was the commander of the Eighth Air Force when I was over there. Um, after four-engine training, where'd you go? Went to Alexandria, Louisiana. I think I got a book over there on it. And, uh, went with her, picked up a crew, Lincoln, Nebraska, took the crew with me, and went to Alexandria and prepared for overseas. We had a bombardier, of course, no navigator then, and a complete crew. And then they trained the many facets at the same time. The gunners, the navigator, and uh, of course the pilot and co-pilot flew all the time. And the bombardiers, we trained and we bombed a target at Jasper, Texas. It was our bombing range. That's where we bombed from. <laughs> and it happened that I got a bombardier named Maxwell M. Cates. And uh, Maxwell M. Cates was from a little town right outside of Dallas. And even though he was uh, one of the best cussers I think I ever heard in my life, he just cussed all the time. <laughs> Not disgust, but cussed. Uh, he uh, knew a northern bomb site backwards and forwards. Took him out one night on the range <clears throat> at Jasper. You had to get the permit to get in it and get out of it, you know, because you had other aircraft in there. And uh, you had two targets, and you bombed those on a square pattern, or a rectangular pattern. And uh, we went out and we made the first run. I got permit, went in, and made the first run on the target. Had a dry run. Bomb didn't go away. And he said, uh, "Dry run." hit the other side. So we came around and hit the other side. And he said, dry run. He said, leave the, uh, leave the target. Get permit and leave the target. So I got permission and left the target. And he said, circle close and I'll check this out. And my co-pilot, whose name was Dave C. Williams, Williams and Williams, he said, I'm going down the nose and see what he's doing. <laughs> He went down there and he was going about three or four minutes to come back and he said, well, we might as well go on back home. He said, he's got that thing scattered all over the nose. And uh, I think there's over 300 parts on it. He said, he'll never get it back together. Well, I said, he'll get it together all right. <laughs> and uh, just while we were conversing, he called on the intercom and said, get a permit and enter the range. And so uh, we entered the range, and he, we made the first run, and he said, dry run, but that nails it down. I'll get it. He said, just go ahead and make the other pattern. I'll get it on the way around. 
and uh, they come back around and bombs away. And I said, well, what in the world was it? And he said, would you believe it? It's a switch on the bomb bay door. <laughs> but he tracked everything out, you know, just like that. Pretty rapid. You know? And he was good. I saw him get two commendations there from the commanding officer of that base where he'd repaired a bomb site in the air that had never been done before at that time. Were you one of them that bombed Boise City? Nope. Have you heard about that? No, I didn't hear about that one. Uh, Jasper, Texas got hit, uh, though, while I was down there. I didn't, I wasn't uh, driving the machine, but it was air, and it was at night, you know. Yeah. Somebody dropped a bomb in yes. there. Yeah, they, they bombed Boy, uh, Boy City. The target had four lights on it. Mm -hmm. they, well, there were similar lights in Boy City, and these uh, men mistaken the Boy City lights for their target. Practice bomb, I hope. Wasn't yes. It? Uh, that, what, ha what happened to Jasper City? What happened there? Jasper, Texas, uh, they got confused and uh, went in and dropped a bomb on them. Jasper. Dropped it through somebody's uh, kitchen. <laughs> How do you get confused in a bomb? I have no idea. I could never figure that out. You know how guys are, you know, laughing about something, and the navigator on that flight. We said, well, it must have been his fault, you know, kidney to him. Then how in the world did he ever, he and the bombardier ever put that together to ever make a run on the town? And this navigator had kind of a twitch, you know, like that. And we'd laugh and say, just don't get a navigator has got a twitch like that. <laughs> and we would just, you know, we didn't say that to him face on, you know, which would have been absurd, you know, to tease about his twitch. We all had other twitches of some kind. <laughs> but uh, they did it. They sure did. Anyone okay. injured in the... No. Very fortunate. Now, Very fortunate. what does a practice bomb consist of? Well, it's, uh, it was a light metal with a very small charge in it. But uh, evidently it would fall as a, you know, as a regular bomb through the air. It was built and shaped like a bomb. It was a light metal with a very light charge. But uh, we had, you know, the targets in that day had a wood shack in the center. And I had, that bombardier I had could blow that shack up on every drop. And you, you probably have read about, know about the old Norden bomb site, but it was hooked to the automatic pilots, you know, and the, the bombardier steered it. But I controlled altitude and airspeed on the drop. And uh, I had a bombardier instructor took us out one day, and he said, we're going to work this old boy out. And I said, well, good, because that's what we were doing, you know. So we got, that was daylight, and it was at 10,000 feet, which is not very high, but uh, we got a permit and entered the range, made a run, he set the shack on fire. And uh, he said, uh, this instructor said to me, he said, we're the only one on this range, right? And I said, right. He said, cut across. Cut off part of the pattern. He said, start your turn right now. And I said, 10-4. And I think I called a control and made a double check. And uh, told him we were going to shorten up our range. And got permission, you know. So I cut across and come around and set the shack on fire. The last bomb we dropped I had just rolled it out on the uh, automatic pilot. I had a little knob there. I maintained the altitude and the airspeed all the way around, and just as I rolled it out, the bomb went away and was set to shack. And the instructor said, that's impossible. He said, let's go to the house. <laughs> <laughs> but that, in, that old boy was accurate with that bomb sight. I, we'd do ph photographic uh, bombing with that, and he'd knock a red horse off of the Magnolia building in Dallas every time he shot at it. And, you know, he took a picture and showed the strike. And he'd hit that red horse every time. In 10,000 people. Uh, I guess the most famous pinpoint bombing in the war is Columbia. Mm -hmm. When they missed the... the Did you look at it there? Yeah. I was in Columbia in January. Mm -hmm. Did they... Did the British have a Northern bomb site when they were bombing 
Cologne to Mystic Cathedral or how You know, they I don't that? know if the British used the Norden bombsite or not. I really don't. I wouldn't be surprised because I don't think they had anything uh, that accurate. Yeah, any idea of why, how they missed it? Or if they didn't have the Norden bombsite, how could they miss the building like that? The cathedral? Yeah. Oh, well, they didn't, nobody ever meant to hit the cathedral, according to my... Of course, they bombed at night, though, didn't they? So how could they yes. I never quite understood how they destroyed Cologne but didn't get the cathedral. Well, they were told not to hit it. They had to know where it was tonight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. You've seen it, haven't you? The, the cathedral? Yeah. No. No. It was started in the year 1248. It's 500 and something feet tall, it's fire. I think it suffered just one or two. Mm -hmm. It suffered minor damage. You were inside of it? Yeah. Did you go in where you could kneel? Only by kneeling could you look up, could you, to the face of Christ? Is this a... Let me see, that's not Cologne. Uh, that's not Cologne, that's another one, huh? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure where that one is. Cologne is the largest cathedral mm -hmm. in the world. Yes. Because when you're inside, the ceiling is 142 feet, straight above you. And it's, that's where the three magi are buried, the three I wise men. Yes. That's why they built that cathedral. I see. And they have uh, the one big statue of Christ, but it's not the one that you're thinking of. That's where this picture was taken from, uh, Ms. Jackson, from the cathedral. And it's not, that's why it's not in the picture. Oh. Is that Cologne? Yes, that's Cologne. And they knew how to set their instruments certain points. <laughs> they knew some, and they, yeah. <laughs> they, maybe they knew where this cathedral was and they purposely didn't set their instruments. But it's at night. It's at night. Well, at night though, but wouldn't it go by instruments instead of light or night or dark? It, well, they're, you know, they're all blacked out in towns where cities were. That's what's amazing. Well, I thought maybe there would be a way they could go on their instruments. I know you're familiar, but you're familiar with what the uh, British were doing bombing at night? Oh, I think I've heard it from interviews. Yeah. There was even a song, I think. USA Bidet, the RAF Bidet and the USA Bidet. The British said it uh, just next to impossible to be bombing at daylight. They'd blow you down. And so the United States took the daylight and they took the night. That's true. And they didn't get shot down there so often as the Americans went down there. Well, I don't know that I'd say uh, that. <laughs> I think they lost as many, if not more. Well, I don't see why not, really, yeah. you know, looking at it. Their uh, anti-aircraft shells were effective within 50 feet or something like that. And they didn't have proximity fuse, which we developed. But, uh, uh, we've seen some German films, and they'd get a one bomber spotlighted in those cross lights, and they'd all get that one. Yeah. Then they'd get another one. Yes. So they, they knew how to do it, too. Um, when did you go overseas? I went over I in, uh, let me see, about uh, January of 1945, uh, the year of the war ended over there. Uh, you fly over? No. When we, I was going over, uh, you're probably familiar with the way they replenish their aircraft, reserve aircraft. You'd fly, they'd take the alphabet and split it. Half would go by boat and half would fly replacement aircraft. Well, it just happened that it was my turn to ride the boat. <laughs> so I, I rode the, His Majesty's ship, the Maritania, which was the fifth largest of the British fleet at the time, commercial fleet, and uh, went over by British boat. How about the trip? How was it? It was, uh, took about eight days. Seven to eight days, and uh, they were zigzagging, you know, which made it take more time. They could outrun submarines, but they zigzagged and changed their course continuously, you know, to miss uh, if a submarine tried to lay in wait. And uh, by the way, the West Point was uh, torpedoed when, on the same time that uh, I was going over. It had to go into the Azores for repairs. Wasn't a bad hit, but it got hit. And uh, 
we were assigned tasks, of course, aboard, and uh, had charge of uh, any time we were ditching, leaving the ship, you know, uh, through lifeboats. Uh, so I was in charge of a group on deck. I never shall forget uh, how mad the captain of that boat made me. <laughs> because we fell out, we, we'd go through uh, training, you know. And uh, they would fall us out just unbeknownst. They'd just call and say, we're going to fall out, you know, to ditch the ship. And uh, so I'd fall out on deck and I'd line my group up, you know, out on deck. And I discovered about the first time we hit the deck that here, this group of men were just totally disorganized over here. And so I crossed over, left mine, you know, standing and just stepped over and lined them up. Well, when the captain looked down, my place was empty. <laughs> you know, so he was after me with a ball peen hammer. <laughs> and uh, I didn't get up to the bridge. I went up to see the captain. <laughs> but they wouldn't let me up there. You know, uh, but I explained to one of his fellow officers there that uh, I had nearly stepped over to take care of another group that was unmanned. And then came back to my. That was the end of the <laughs> conflict. You know, the British were so different in a sense than we. Uh, they fed their men like pigs and treated their enlisted men like hogs. And uh, we were in the battle form and shape and uh, ready to go in battle. And I, I didn't know if I was going to keep my men alive to get them over there to, to fight, you know. So we carried them food from our mess hall, and they ate down in the hole, what I'd call right next to good pig slop. And uh, it didn't uh, make me mad, it just kind of boiled my oil a little, you know. So I saw to it that they had everything that my officers could carry to them to keep them in good health <laughs> until we got them over so we could use them to fight. Where'd you land? We landed at uh, where the Beatles came from. What's the name of it? Liverpool. Liverpool. We landed in Liverpool. And uh, then went to a, a center nearby where they just sent people out from, you know. We uh, trained into this center. And uh, I recall that the, the officers drew straws, and I wasn't a, I wasn't there. I told him that just wasn't a fair deal, you know. <laughs> but I wound up being baggage officer coming off of the Maritania, you know, for the unloading. The, so all night long when we landed there, well, I was in charge of unloading baggage. So I didn't get any sleep that night. We were unloading baggage and uh, then trucking it uh, to the train. And then we went from there to the uh, replacement center or assignment center. Mm -hmm. And from there, where'd you go? Went to the 390th bomb group at uh, Framingham, which is at, it's called, it's called Framingham, but it, it's right near Ipswich, southeast England. Mm -hmm. And when did you make your first bombing run? Uh, Date-wise, I can't uh, really give you that date, but uh, I'd only been on the base and assigned to a uh, squadron about uh, four days, and we lost two planes in a mid-air collision in our squadron. And uh, so that evening after that occurred, the commanding officer of the squadron called out for myself and the old boy that I flew with in uh, Roswell, New Mexico, training in four engine, Isaac Wilson, for us to come to the ready room in the squadron. And we came up, and when I joined him, you know, going up, I was farthest away. And uh, when we went in, uh, the colonel said, uh, call the coin. He flipped it. It was a half crown. Not a half crown. It was a half crown. He flipped it, and uh, I called it. And he said, well, Williams, he said, you won. He said, you get the battle of hunt tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, 
so he explained very rapidly. He said, what we'll do is we'll take your co-pilot and put him with an experienced pilot and we'll give you his co-pilot because they are checked out in the code of the islands and I was not, neither was my co-pilot. And you could get shot down just flying off the coast of England by your own an aircraft. I had it protected pretty well. Now, when, when you say code of the islands, what? Yes. The code and the procedure that you followed any time you left the island or came into the island, uh, you had to know how to do it and what it was, you know. Uh, your approach, how you made your approach, uh, or you could be shot down. Because the Germans had captured uh, many B-17s and they used them, even brought them within uh, flights of B-17s and shot down our own airplanes with uh, our old aircraft. So you had to be. How did you leave the island? What was, what was the code? Well, actually, uh, the code was in uh, primarily an identifying thing that was on the aircraft, plus uh, the angle and the approach that you came in, unless you were leaving in a bomb stream, which I left every time I left in a bomb stream except after the war had uh, closed down where I could make a bomb stream. Bomb stream was uh, one bomb group right behind another. And that bomb stream would reach for sometimes, I suppose, 100 miles. And how many in a group? How many? 40 airplanes in a group. 40 airplanes in a group. Flying a, a diamond. I think you can probably see some of them in the, that uh, book there. Mm -hmm. But you'd have a squadrons like this, two squadrons and two squadrons like this. Yeah. And the front, if you looked at the front of them, it, it came back like this. The top squadron was up here and the bottom one was down here and the other two were on the side. Yeah. The top bombs fell right in front of the nose of the bottom squadron. That's for strike, you know. Mm -hmm. right. Was there ever an accident in these? There were known to be accidents, yes. In fact, this, uh, the worst accident I ever heard of was uh, we bombed a group of B-24s. Your own? Our own. It was the B-24's mistake, B-24 commander. We hit what you called an initial point, and everybody made their approach on the target from the IP, the initial point. And you were timed in there to the minute and the second. When you hit that thing, you know, you were set up for timing. And then another group would hit it. They were sure that everything else was away from it. But, you know, they were just pretty well bang, bang, one right after another. Well, we bombed one day with B-24s at low level and B-17s from high level. And we had a flight. We had a cloud deck in between. And they had them timed into the target off the IP. The IP was the same. A B-24 outfit, like I say, the, the IP was here. And they were making the approach, uh, we we'll say, from a direction like this. Come in to hit the IP and turn into the target. The B-24s coming underneath came in 